So Dr. Stephen Lewis is uh, from New, Jer New Jersey, if I'm right. New Jersey, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so he has extensive uh, ministry experience and also a PhD in, let me get this right, hermeneutics right. and biblical interpretation in the Old Testament. Yep. Currently, he's a lecturer in uh, Old Testament and Hebrew at the Reformed Theological College. So let's give him uh, another warm welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for the welcome and just for showing up tonight um, on an evening to, to think about things that uh, are interesting, but maybe you are wondering um, how, how important it might be. Like, uh, does it really matter what one believes about the future and about what Jesus has accomplished already? Um, if you can picture yourself with Peter, James, and John, Bartholomew, all the disciples who were gazing into heaven, think Acts chapter 1. They are looking up into heaven, and Jesus has just ascended. And a cloud hides him from their sight. But they're still craning their necks looking up. And then the angel tells them, what are you doing? What, why are you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus that you saw go into heaven, he will come again in the same way that you have seen him go. So if we can remember that and hold on to that and treasure that and bank our life on it, then we can disagree about all kinds of details. And no matter what particular view or perspective you are persuaded of eventually or already, it won't matter because we'll be brothers and sisters together believing that this same Jesus that went into heaven will come back again. I mean, that is just the solid thing that hopefully every Christian united to Jesus by faith could get behind and say amen to that. So, okay, we're thinking, though, about this Thing called the millennium and the thousand year reign of Christ and his saints, his people. And let me see if I can do this. Uh huh. So usually people have questions, curiosity questions, sometimes existential questions like what if someone is suffering, enduring great pain, and even oppression, they are wondering, how long, oh Lord, do I have to put up with this, right? And so some people have real personal reasons for caring about the last days. And we wonder sometimes when we hear news reports or current events that are a bit scary and it sounds like the world is going to, the world as we know it is going to end, we're like, is this the last time? It's helpful to remember that when the Bible uses the phrase, the last days, it means the whole time period. It means the last 2,000 years. The whole time since Jesus ascended into heaven until now, it has been the last days. Now, so if, if someone is wondering, are we in the last days? Maybe what they are wondering is, are we at the end of the last days? Like, are we in the very, very, very last days? It's like, I, I know what you mean. <laughs> You're wondering, is, is Jesus coming back soon? Which is, is not a bad question. But remember how Jesus spoke about this. He said, be faithful. Be that servant who's busy about his master's business so that when the master returns, you're just doing what you were faithfully called to do, right? So the meaning of the phrase end time or last days, how does the Bible use it? Well, in Acts chapter 2, Peter is standing there preaching on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit had been poured out by Christ on his church. And people are hearing the gospel preached to them in their own language. And Peter had quite the opportunity to cut to the heart and call people to repent and to believe in Christ. That who died in our place, who rose from the dead for us. And... He says, Peter does, in his sermon, he's, ab he's about ready to quote the prophet Joel. And 
Joel uses the phrase, you know, in the latter days, in the last days, and Peter says in verse 16, but this, talking about what just had been, happened, the miracle of them hearing the gospel in their own language, this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel, and in the last days it shall be. So what Peter is saying is, when Joel said, in the last days something is going to happen, Peter is saying, it's happening, it's happening right now. This is what, P is what Joel said was going to be the last days. So that shows you that Peter understood that right there as he stood there, what year was it? People disagree, was it like 33 AD, 30, 35, 30, somewhere in there, the, in the early 30s uh, of what some people call the common era, the year of our Lord, that was already the last days. Which maybe you're thinking, eh, how, how can it be the last days for 2,000 years? And you remember, Peter talks about this in his second letter. He says, well, people are going to be mocking you, saying, uh, or is it his first Peter? I always get first and second Peter mixed up. But uh, Peter says, you know, people will mock. They will scoff. They will make fun and say, oh, where is Jesus? He said he's coming, and he hasn't come yet. Uh, and, and so Peter gives us a reason for the extension of the last days. He says God is patient. Basically, God wants more people to be freed from their sins and to worship him with all that they are. He wants people from every tribe, tongue, and nation to worship him. So that's why the last days has been stretched out so long and maybe why it will keep being stretched out for a good long time for all we know. Okay. So the meaning of the thousand years, because if, if we've been in a long 2,000 year stretch of the last days, what about the thousand years, the millennium? Um, the millennium, the thousand years, is only mentioned in one book of the Bible, in the book of Revelation. That's where we read about it in Revelation 20. If we have time, we'll actually get into that text. But how should we interpret numbers when they appear in the book of Revelation. For example, 144,000 people are mentioned in the book of Revelation. Does that mean not 148,999 and not 140,003? <laughs> or is it exactly literally 140,000? Now, for me to even ask that question, you might be wondering, can I trust you? Because now you're pretending like the Bible doesn't mean what it says. But here's the deal. There are times in the Bible where the prophet is speaking about things that you and I cannot truly imagine because we haven't been there. John was seeing visions of the future and he's trying to communicate them and the Holy Spirit is inspiring him to communicate them in a particular way which literary people call apocalyptic literature. So the apocalypse, the unveiling, the revealing, the, the pulling back the curtain and looking back at what's apocalyptic literature. And in apocalyptic literature, the genre, the currency, the way people communicate in apocalyptic visions is through symbols. And so remember in Revelation, when Jesus shows up, chapter 1, he shows up with a sword in his mouth, and he's blazing, strong, brilliant light. Later in the book of Revelation, Jesus shows up as a lamb that has been slain, but is still alive, or has come to life again. So in other words, Jesus is presented to you in apocalyptic literature symbolically. When John sees Jesus in the book of Revelation in the visions, he sees him symbolically as a lamb. So if people can be expressed as symbols in these biblical visions, is it possible? I don't, I'm not asking you to agree with me right away on anything, but is it possible that if Jesus can be presented as a lamb, is it possible that a number such as 1,000 can be given to you as a symbol. 
Um, I think it is. I think that the numbers in the book of Revelation are symbolic, that they don't necessarily have to be 1,000 years, not 999, not 1,001, that it could be that 1,000 years of the 1,000 years is the time in which we now live. It's, it's possible, at least keep that open as a possibility that these past 2,000 years have been the first part of the symbolic 1,000 year reign. Now, what would be the meaning of that symbol 1,000? It'd be like 10 times 10 times 10, right? It's like it times another 10. Um, it, it's a, you take a perfect number like the Hebrew mindset, three was an important number, seven was even more important. 10 was a particular rounded number. You make, you know, you have your 10 fingers and all. And, and to speak of a thousand was to speak of the really long, impressive time period. It was just a way of saying a good, long, long time of, of the, the perfect kingdom of God. So let's take a look at Revelation 20. I saw an angel coming down from heaven, John says, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit. Do you think these are literal things, or is the key a symbol and the bottomless pit a symbol? It's hard to know sometimes when you're reading prophecy, but let's keep an open mind. Might be a literal key, might be a literal thousand years, but maybe the key is a symbol of something. Okay. A great chain and seized the dragon. Hmm, wonder who he is. If, if you're open to thinking that the dragon is Satan, that's a symbol of a person. And so maybe a thousand years is also a symbol. Um, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, so you have to believe that he's Satan because the Bible says so and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer. Hmm. So this thousand year period, oh, we didn't get to that part, uh, until the thousand years were ended and after that he must be released for a little while. So this thousand year period, whatever it is, it's a special time. It's a special time in human history when that ancient serpent, the devil, Satan, the dragon is in the bottomless pit and the key has locked it shut so that he can no longer deceive the nations so that the gospel can go forward people can be converted from every nation every culture every land on earth this is the idea now maybe you're thinking hey I walked here tonight from this uh, train station or I took the tram or I j whatever and I saw plenty of evidence. Uh, and on my phone, I saw plenty of evidence. And in my own head, I've experienced plenty of evidence that Satan is uh, active in the earth today. What do you mean that he's locked away in a bottomless pit and, you know, they haven't thrown away the key, but, you know, they locked it. So, uh, so let's just park that question there and, and, and consider, is, is it possible that Satan can be locked up in one respect, but still still doing stuff also. I think of some of these guys that get locked up in prison and somehow they're getting drugs into the prison. <laughs> some, somehow they're like making deals and people are still getting killed out there because of decisions they made. This kind of thing happens, but, but all that is specifically said here about Satan being locked up is so that he can no longer deceive the nation. So I'll have to think more about that in a minute. All right, so the use of numbers in apocalyptic literature, we've kind of mentioned that. I got ahead of myself. Um, let's take a look at that so that language in Revelation 20 again. He's been locked up so that he might not deceive the nations any longer. Now maybe you're thinking, hmm, I see a lot of deception going on in the nations. People are deceived politically, they're deceived religiously, they're deceived in their worldview in so many levels. But 
the miracle that takes place when the Holy Spirit brings new birth, regeneration, faith, and repentance to someone. You know, this is something we pray for our loved one, for our friend, our co-worker. Lord, change their life. Give them saving faith in Jesus. This sort of thing, right? That moment when the Holy Spirit is disabusing that person of all the deception that they've been in all their life, how does that happen? This is mysterious. This is why we pray. God, convert them, because I can't get into their heart and mind. But, but the idea that the Holy Spirit would be at work all over the earth today, bringing people to Christ through the preaching of regular Christians like you and me, as we share the gospel all over the place, the Holy Spirit is at work, and people are coming to faith all over the world. Uh, could it be that some of the backstory there is that people that the Holy Spirit is doing this work in good, fertile soil, in good, plowed ground. Like, the, the word is going forth into a field. If you think of Jesus' parable of the sow, sowing of the seed, this is all happening, and, and harvest is coming because, thankfully, that other character, the one in Jesus' parable who was going around throwing weed seeds, and, and the people said, well, where did these weed, weeds come from? And in the parable, it's like, well, some, some enemy has done this, right? So the idea is that, is, is that Satan character, is he locked up right now, not in every respect, but symbolically is he locked up in this respect, that he's not being allowed to deceive the nations. Another, the, another way to talk about this is, do you believe that Jesus, who's King of kings and Lord of lords, do you think of his reign, his rule as king, do you think of him as successful? Is, or is his reign as a king just meeting with defeat after defeat? Some people are like, well, Jesus is king, or he should be king, but um, he's really not king right now. Like, he will be king when he comes back with the second coming. Or he will be king once we as a church throughout the world rise up and do what we're supposed to do. And, and, and we change the world completely and we, we take over the government and the entertainment world and, and the schools and we just change everything into the way it should be. Then Jesus will be king. So these kinds of thoughts are, are thinking, yes, Jesus deserves to be king, and he will be king someday. But my question for you is, what about right now? Is Jesus successfully reigning as king right now? And I would, I would suggest that he is in all the ways that matter most. But we don't think so. We think, oh, because what would really impress us is if Jesus was reigning successfully in such a way as to take over the government. Or Jesus was reigning successfully in such a way as to remove all economic oppression. Or Jesus was reigning in such a way as to make my own family so much more at peace. But when you think about what Jesus really is doing and through the Holy Spirit, through the preaching of the gospel, through ordinary Christians like us, and how people's lives really are changing from darkness to light and from bondage to freedom. And people are like finally getting answers and they're like, wow, he's, he's my savior and my Lord. They don't usually say, when a new person comes to faith in Christ, you don't usually hear them say, I'm so thankful that you told me about Jesus because one of these days he's going to be my savior and Lord when he comes again, as if it's all postponed to the future. No, they, they have this sense of the present as he is king of kings, isn't he? And there's just this joy. And that's, that's relevant to this question about what about the thousand years? Well, the idea is maybe, maybe it is that this thousand years, which we have to admit, the book of Revelation is challenging. Like, I was a little nervous coming tonight talking about this stuff because we can talk about it in the Q&A time. But, like, I could be wrong about some of my opinions and interpretations. And I'm certainly open to someone showing me a better way. You know, that's what Priscilla and Aquila did for Apollo. All right, so I want to talk briefly about three major different opinions 
that Christians have about the thousand years, about the future, about the second coming of Christ. These three different views, each one of them shares some common ground. They, they share personal, genuine faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord. But they disagree about some of the details of the future. And let's take a look at that. So, so one group, we can call them the pre-millennial group. Pre-millennialism, the pre means before, before the thousand years, Jesus will come back to rescue his church, whisk her away to heaven in a rapture, like we'll be caught up together with him in the clouds, says Paul in 1 Thessalonians. And uh, Jesus comes back to rescue a church that's in danger of, you know, being persecuted to death. The millennium then, after Jesus takes the church away to heaven, then there will be this millennial kingdom, this thousand-year kingdom, perfect kingdom on earth, and it's mainly a time for Jewish people to come to faith in Christ, according to this view. And it's kind of this golden age. And, and people who hold this perspective, they go to a, a passage that we'll look at, Lord willing, tonight, in the book of Isaiah. And they say, this is the golden age. This is the thousand-year reign. And after that thousand years, literally, after it's literally over, like 999 plus 1, then boom, some angel's going to release that Satan from the bottomless pit, and he's going to come out and wreak havoc again. So there's going to be this golden age, according to premillennialism, that then, then there's going to be this like horrific falling away. I mean, some of us are dismayed right now because statistically the church in certain parts of the West has been declining numerically, some places, and we're all freaking out about that. Why is it happening? Well, at the end of the thousand years, according to premillennialism, that's going to happen big time. Like, I don't, well, I shouldn't criticize too much here. So, anyways, that's the view of premill. You will find old books that w won't use the word premillennialism. They'll call it killiism. Killiism. Okay, same thing. Historic premillennialism, I think, is a respectable position to hold. George Eldon Ladd, a great theologian, wrote a lot of good books in the 1970s and 80s about historic premill. If you've heard of Francis Schaeffer or James Montgomery Boyce, there are some really solid Bible teaching theologians over the last 50, 100 years who have held to historic premill. This is a kind of like what I was just saying, except that they have a simpler, I think, um, better view than the one I was just saying, but it's still believing that Things are going to get bad, and then Jesus will come back. There's a particular type of premillennialism called dispensationalism. And if you have questions about that later, feel free to ask me. I was raised in a dispensational church. Um, if I came home as a boy in the early 1970s, and my sister wasn't there, and my mom and dad weren't there, and I was freaking out wondering why I was the only one left here in the family, I knew probably why. It was because Jesus had come, the rapture had come, and I had been left behind. I wish we'd all been ready, and I guess I wasn't. I should have prayed the prayer more sincerely to accept Jesus. This is, this is the doubts that would go through my mind as a kid. Well, that's, that fit into a system called dispensationalism, which has some good points to it. But, by the way, all these slides are available. You can get them from David later. Um, progressive dispensationalism is an attempt to improve the system, but a distinct, distinguishing mark of it is, is believing that God has one plan for Israel, for the Jews, and he has a different plan for the church. This is how a dispensationalist will read the Bible. Okay. So when I was in, um, when I was a uni student in the late 1980s, a book came out. My dad was a pastor. He said, Stephen, here's this book. 88 reasons why Jesus is coming in 1988. So 88 came and it went and Jesus had not come. Well, come to find out, the author, Edgar Wisnett, he, um, he was a humble man and when he realized that he was wrong, he went back to his notes and he did more calculations and, and worked with the numbers again and he came out with another book the next year. <laughs> 89 reasons why Jesus is coming back in 1989. 
And then, and just to hedge his bets, he called it the rapture report and was extending into the early 90s. Uh, a character on the radio, Harold Campion of Family Radio, he was at the time telling people that Jesus was coming back in 1994. And so every once in a while in church history, there is this end times mania that takes over and people are like, you don't have to persuade me. Did you see what happened to the stock market? Did you see that there was a 6.8 earthquake in Jakarta? You know, like there's just always reasons for people to think, yeah, we're the terminal generation. And we might be, so I don't want to make fun of that. It's to be ready for our Lord's return is a good thing. To be saying that you know that he's coming back in 1988 is like not a good thing. Like, please don't do that. All right. Um, so, hey, when you have a conversation like we're going to have tonight about the end times, you have to have charts. <laughs> like, uh, you can thank me that I didn't have garish looking, you know, pictures of the four horses of the apocalypse and, you know, the bowls of wrath pouring out. But just a nice, friendly chart. This is the premillennial chart. And notice where we are on the chart. We are in the church age. It has parentheses around it because it's kind of parenthetical because God has always really been most interested in the Jews, according to premillennialism, and then he's going to be interested in them again. But in this kind of parenthetical time, good, you and I are in the parenthetical time because that's when God's okay with us. So we're, we're in the church age, and then all this strange stuff is going to happen for seven years of the tribulation, and then the literal thousand millennial years will come. That's when Satan will be bound. He's not bound now, according to premillennialism. And then Satan will be loosed, and then the eternal state. We're skipping over all kinds of interesting stuff in there in the fine print. The temple's going to be rebuilt in Jerusalem. They're going to sacrifice animals on the altar again. And you might be wondering, hey, wait a minute. Wasn't Jesus the final sacrifice? What, what are we doing building it? Didn't Jesus say, destroy this temple, and I will raise it up again? And in John chapter 2, John says, Jesus was talking about himself, like he is the temple. So this particular way of reading the Bible, though, says, look, if it says it in the Bible, it's got to be literal. We take it literal whenever possibly. And so this is what the premillennial position believes. So we're going to keep going here. There's some strengths and some weaknesses here. I, to me, that chart that I just had on the screen is pretty complicated. Believe me, as a boy, I heard sermon after sermon on this stuff, and I... I took it in, and I could write out the, the chart for you right now. I mean, so you can learn it, but it's complicated. And it doesn't seem to, from my perspective, to be in tune with the purpose of the scripture when the biblical writers tell us about the future. Like when Paul writes to the Thessalonians about the end times, he says, therefore, comfort one another with these words. He tells them all about what we call the rapture and stuff, and then he says, comfort one another with these words. Don't freak people out with these words and get them all scared and manipulated and like, ah, I'm going to do whatever you say now. Sell my house, quit my job, you know. Pray the prayer because he's coming back in 2024. Um, I think also a weakness of this view is that it seems obsessed with current events. And it seems obsessed with the state of Israel, which I, I'm a fan of, you know, the state of Israel if we're talking about Middle Eastern politics and stuff. But, but some people aren't just like, oh, I support that country for this or that political reason. They, they, they think that it's eschatologically significant, you understand. And so this view seems to be more interested in what's happening in Jerusalem today politically than they are with the gospel. Now, I'm being maybe uncharitable and maybe premillennial people right here in the room are like no that does not represent <laughs> me so I'm fine to be corrected on that the strength of this view the premillennial view is they take every word in the Bible seriously they're not about to say well that's just a metaphor you know if something's in the Bible premillennialist is going to say that's God's holy word without an error and that's a real strength of this view. Because sometimes people are just like, well, you can't know the future. And so, 
Hey, but the question is, what if God has revealed something? The premillennialist is ready to believe it. Okay. But they're just one view. There's another, another view, post-mill. So this is the idea that Jesus comes back after the thousand years. And what the post-millennialist believes is that the church will be successful in this present age and will Christianize the entire earth and usher in a golden age. And then Jesus is coming back not to rescue us from persecution and martyrdom, but kind of to high five us all. Like, hey, you did it. This is great. You, you, you succeeded. It, 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 it worked. It happened. And um, some post millennialists would say that's a literal thousand years. Some would say, no, it's, it's been increasing over time, so it could be symbolic of many years. But the important thing to them is that Jesus succeeds in his church in history. And what they mean by history is before Jesus comes back. Now, I've never really figured out why history doesn't just keep continuing after Jesus comes back. Like, there must be continuity there. But it's just like, it's very important to a post-mill person that every promise in the Bible comes true before, you know, Jesus comes back. Like, this, it's... Jesus is successful politically, economically, in all the public social institutions. That's what the post-mill vision is. It's like every square inch of every human reality, every aspect of culture will be won and taken over and Christianized. Okay. So if you, you might see these terms in articles, books, or uh, you know, any source that you go to for information, preterism. So we're talking about the future, but preterite, you know, is past. So the preterist view is associated with postmillennialism. It's this, that the prophecies about the future in the New Testament, like when Jesus gives what we call the Olivet Discourse, he's on the Mount of Olives, and he says, hey, let the reader understand, um, flee to the mountains when the abomination of desolation is done in the temple, and Pray that it won't be in winter and uh, that you don't have little nursing children. Just get out of Jerusalem when all these bad things start happening. And Jesus says that that's just the start of the, the birth pangs of, of giving birth when there's earthquakes and wars and rumors of wars. So the preterist view is when Jesus is saying all those things, that it was future from Jesus' vantage point. But for you and me, it's all past because it all happened in 70 AD when the Roman legionaries came in to Jerusalem. They eventually built siege ramps. They took over the city. They destroyed the temple. It was a bloodbath. So many people died because Jerusalem was caught up in this zealot rebellion against the Roman Empire at the time. And, and the preterite view is even the book of Revelation was looking forward to all the things that took place in 70 AD. There are people that hold a full preterist view that even say Jesus has already come back the second time. And I'm kind of man, like, oh, really? So that, that seems to me a real problem. Because <laughs> remember, we started out with Acts chapter 1. This same Jesus who you saw go will, will come again in the same way. And that doesn't seem to have happened yet. But um, a more respectable version of this view is partial preterism. And that's just saying that a lot of those things that Jesus spoke about and a lot of the book of Revelation took place in 70 AD and then that stuff speaks towards the final crisis that is yet in the future so there are some nuances to all these things all right so the post-millennial chart it's simpler I think it's moving in the right direction look look at look at that increasing line over time like from the time of Jesus on the cross and the empty tomb and the ascension into heaven, this present age, the world is gradually getting better. Gradually the world is getting Christianized. And then Christ returns for the final judgment and then the eternal state, the eschaton, the new heavens and the new earth. All right. Postmillennialism, some strengths and weaknesses. I think a weakness is it's hard finding a passage in the Bible that explicitly tells you the post-mill view. 
I think the best you can find are some of Jesus' parables, where he says the kingdom of God is like some yeast that's put into a dough, and the idea is the yeast takes over the whole dough. Post-millennialists love that, because it's like, see, that's the church taking over the whole ball of wax, the whole culture, the, the, the whole world, every aspect of it. It could be that Jesus is just saying the church is going to be salt and light all over the world. Whether we're taking over or we're just present and being like punched in the ribs every other day, but we're present. You know, there's different ways to be spread out over the whole world. But anyways, um, this gives you a sense of the chart from a post-mill view. Um, yeah. A strength of the post-millennialists, I think, is that they believe in the power and the success of the gospel. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of salvation for everyone who believes. First the Jew, then the Greek. Post-millennialists believe that, and they, they're ready to attempt great things for God and pray big, crazy prayers because they're not about to be pessimistic about, oh, everything's going to get worse, and then the end will come. Like they're, they're like, no, ready to storm the gates of hell, right? Okay. Amillennialism does happen to be the view that I hold, and many other people, and there's good people in all three of these views. The A, ah, the A means no. So not an exact thousand years, not a literal year, thousand years, but a symbolic uh, thousand years uh, between the first coming and the second coming of Christ, in which... Satan is locked up in this respect that he cannot deceive the nations and then the church grows. But as the church grows, we should expect pushback and increased persecution. So from the amillennial perspective, if you ask an amillennialist, are things getting better or worse? They'll probably say yes, like both. Things are getting better because the church is growing all over the world. And as we grow, that's a perceived threat to the powers that be, and they're pushing back. And so there's actually more persecution today, but that's correlating with greater growth of the church. Um, I could recommend some books to you. Kim Riddlebarger's book is great. I learned a lot of things just this past week, getting ready for tonight by reading his book. Uh, the Bible in the Future by Hokema, another great book. Find any book by G.K. Beale on this subject of the book of Revelation or Poitras. These are great amillennialist authors. Dennis Johnson does a great job in his commentary on Revelation, The Triumph of the Lamb. So triumph, the success of the lamb that was slain. And, and in, hidden in that title is this idea of, yeah, the success of the gospel at the cost of suffering and persecution. Because there's some people that only want to talk about success, your best life now. Or there's people that only want to talk about defeat. Everything's going to hell, and then the end will come. So the Amil view is like kind of trying to say both and. All right. Here's the Amil chart. It's similar to the post-millennial chart in its simplicity, except it doesn't claim that we will slowly be taking over the world institutions. For all we know, will continue to be a present minority all over the world. But the key is all over the world, that the a knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Um, some strengths and weaknesses. A weakness, some people will accuse amillennialists of just explaining away things, saying, oh, that's a symbol. Uh, that, that's a metaphor. And, and you hear me say that, you might think, man, there he goes again. He said the thousand years is a metaphor. He said the, the bottomless pit was a metaphor. Like you're just explaining things away. You're just spiritualizing things. Whereas some people say, no, it's literal. So you can see how that could be a, a weakness of the amillennial view. Uh, I think a strength is its simplicity. It's like it's not that Jesus comes back a second and a third time. He just comes back a second time. That's the final day, and it's judgment day, and salvation day, all at once. And it's not like, First, there's the first three and a half years, and then a second three and a half years, and after that, then the millennium, and then after that. Now, all of those are real numbers in the actual biblical books, and you'd have to read some of these other books to read the arguments that people have about it. All right. Um, what do you think? Doesn't matter. Um, 
do I have to choose? Do I have to choose a side, like join a tribe, and say, okay, I went to that meeting, and the guy was really wanting me to be an all-millennialist, so I'll do it. <laughs> no. So I'm going to ask you to take, um, let's say, seven minutes, thereabouts, at your table. <laughs> Not to make a decision, but yeah, yeah, three and a half, like a mid-trip. Uh, um, my, I said my dad was a pastor. One of the elders in our church came to him one day and said to my dad, Phil, it was his name, he said, Phil, you can, you can kick me off the elder board if you want, but I'm no longer a pre-trib, pre-mill person. My dad was like, oh, what have you done? You haven't joined the post-mills, have you? And his name was Ray. Ray's like, I'm a mid-trib. Okay? He read a book and it was persuasive to him that Jesus comes back at point three and a half of the seven years. And my dad was like, Ray, you're my brother in Christ. I'm like, there's room in this church for pre and mid. And, there, and my dad was so flexible, there was even room for post. But, um, okay, but does it matter? All right, so I'd like you to talk in your group. Here's the basic question. Um, and you can kind of ignore everything I just said in the last 30 minutes or so and just go with them. Um, which of these views, Jesus coming back before the thousand years, after the thousand years, or the, the thousand years is the current reign of Christ and that it's a symbol, which of these makes most sense to you at the moment and why? And especially if there's someone who has a different perspective, like give them some air time in your table. And if you're yeah, or if you're not at a table, just, you know, talk amongst two or more. And let's take about seven minutes on that. All right, thanks so much for taking the time to uh, listen to each other. And I want to uh, make a few comments on why I think eschatology matters, why I think it is good and helpful for our growth in grace, our, our discipleship, our sanctification to keep in mind that Jesus is coming again, that it really does matter. Whether it matters which view we hold, I'm not so sure that that exactly matters, but um, eschatology, studying what God has revealed about the present and future, this does matter. It does make a difference. It makes a difference to how you read the Bible. If if you are open to reading the Bible both literally when it's supposed to be literal and figuratively when it's supposed to be figurative, like if you can become a discerning, skillful reader of the Bible, that will be a good thing. So it's something that we all need to grow in and no matter which view we hold, we wanna, we wanna let our eschatology shape how we read the Bible. Your eschatology will shape your overall vision of life. Some people have a very negative view, not just about their own personal life, but about the church in general and the, this present age. Others have this sense of like, we're taking over, a triumphal thing. And then the, the third option that I've been recommending to you is this combination of realistically looking at this fallen world, but also having hope, not hope necessarily about taking over institutions, but hope in the Holy Spirit's use of the word of God to change people's lives forever. It will, your eschatology will shape which priorities you embrace. Now, an old premillennial saying that certain evangelists made famous was, this was back when the Titanic, the sinking of the Titanic was recent event. Uh, uh, an evangelist was talking about uh, a sinking ship as a metaphor in saying you don't polish the brass on a sinking ship. Instead, you go around that ship saying, do you know the Lord Jesus? Do, do you know where you will spend eternity? Like you focus on saving souls. You don't focus on changing the local high school culture or, you know, writing poetry to the glory of God. All of this sounds trivial to the person who's like, it's a sinking ship. One priority, soul winning, okay? Other people 
their eschatology is shaping their priorities like, no, we're going we're gonna to infiltrate every institution on earth and see if we can strategically, you know, take it. Whereas the amillennial view is trying to be salt and light, like Jesus told us to be, in all aspects of life. Like Abraham Kuyper, the great Dutch theologian, said, there is not one square inch on this planet over which Jesus has not claimed, I am Lord. Stating it positively, Jesus has claimed lordship over every square inch of the earth, over every square inch of life. That's true. But Kuyper was not suggesting that, oh, we will necessarily in this age before Jesus comes back, take over every square inch. It, it's more like every square inch deserves to be uh, you know, given over to submission to Christ. Uh, your eschatology will shape how you pray. If you use the Lord's Prayer as a model for praying and you pray maybe five minutes for every petition in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day our daily bread, and you start praying for your neighbor who's unemployed right now, or for you, a, a group of people that God's placed in your heart that's suffering you know, poverty, give us this day our daily bread, and it shapes your prayers, and then you get to the part of the prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Is your understanding of the kingdom merely something in a far future, or is your understanding of the kingdom that it's present, and future, and so you would pray, Lord, Father in heaven, our, our heavenly Father, may your kingdom come, like now. M may your will be done, the implication of the prayer is now, on earth as it is in heaven. It, it's, not, it's not pretending that, oh, everything will get better in five minutes, but your eschatology will shape the way you pray. Uh, it'll shape your attitude towards culture. You know, do you have a, a healthy view of, let's say, non-Christian culture so that you can say, by God's common grace, he has given talents to women and men of all different types and all different kinds of giftedness. And we can appreciate that while also discerning the antithesis between light and darkness and not being deceived about that. And, and, and so if, if you have... A, a biblically nuanced view of culture, um, you're not going to be locked into like, oh, the culture is bad, I'm going to escape it, nor will you be naive and just embrace it, right? Okay, so your eschatology shapes your view of culture, shapes your view of the church. Uh, do you see the church as this perpetually defeated group that's just like, when we talk remnant talk, that's an Old Testament word, the remnant. Do you see the remnant as, like, bruised and bloodied? And when Jesus asks the question, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Do you think, yeah, that's a real question. Like, it's going to be me and, like, my cousin. Just the two of us. You know, or, or is your view of the church that, oh, when Jesus comes, will he find faith on the earth? Of course he will, because he's coming back post-millennially, and everyone will be a Christian pretty much when he comes back. So I uh, don't know why Jesus asked that question, because the obvious answer is yes, he will find lots of faith on the earth. Or is your attitude towards the church of this kind of already and not yet? By the way, that's kind of a phrase that amillennialists use ad nauseum, already and not yet. Well, um, so it shapes your appreciation for the depth and breadth of the gospel. Um, that both things are true. The conversion of individuals, the new birth, new life in Christ, someone receiving forgiveness for their sins and knowing that Jesus is their Savior and Lord. This is huge. And, and, and it is definitely a priority, but it's also a priority to be present in all of life and do all kinds of good, God-glorifying vocations to the glory of God, right? Um, just to make the point at the end of that slide, the amillennialist does not insist that some level of outward successful metric be attained before Jesus comes back. Rather, the amillennialist expects that as the church grows, precisely because the church is growing, there will be increased pushback. And so you get more persecution. Um, 
in terms of how your eschatology shapes your appreciation for the depth of the gospel, think about Isaac Watts when he paraphrases a psalm into that Christmas carol hymn, Joy to the World, the Lord has come, let earth receive her king. And that wonderful poetry in the second verse, I think, he, Jesus, comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. Don't you just love that? The curse, ever since Genesis 3, has typified childbirth and the pain and frustration of working, our, our, our work, that the earth seems to be groaning. Paul says in Romans 8 that the, the earth is groaning, waiting for the children of God to be revealed, right? Well, if, if Jesus is coming to make his blessings flow, to every place that curse is, to reverse the curse. This is joy to the world indeed. So whether Jesus finishes that work before he comes, finishes it through his church, or finishes it after he comes, the idea is he does it. So we'll be looking at some passages, but one that you've probably memorized is Philippians 1.6. He who began a good work in you, the Lord Jesus, he will be faithful, Paul says to the Philippians, he'll be faithful to complete that good work in you until the day of Christ, right? So um, that good work is good work within you. I say that because the post-millennialist is like, oh yeah, he, he's going to complete that good work within you and outside of you, like as if the good work is changing the externals of the world. All Paul says in Philippians 1.6 is the good work within you, okay? Um, which he will complete at his return on the day of Christ. Okay. So, uh, do I have to make a choice between these three? And really, I've oversimplified things. There's more than three views. Like, there's views underneath each of these, okay? Um, I don't think so. I don't think it's like choosing a tribe and getting your membership card. I would say instead, positively, if you're interested in this, instead of taking eschatology as a subject that, oh, I'm going to study this so I can make my fellow Christians feel stupid because they hold the wrong view, instead of having that as your mindset, look at it this way. There's a lot of texts in the Bible that are challenging that even people that are full-time studying this have questions about. So if you're interested in this stuff, get involved, and, and God might help you be the one to teach us a better understanding. You know, that, that'd be great. So work on the challenging text, and keep listening to your friends who have a different perspective, your friends in the body of Christ. I mean. All right. Now, now we're going to finally look at some Bible texts. Okay, so in Genesis 3, you've probably memorized this. Uh, this is the, the gospel preached right there after our first parents fell into sin. Um, uh, the Lord is speaking, and he's actually addressing the serpent and says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. This is the gospel predicting Jesus's death on the cross and his triumph over the evil one and it's eschatological it's like looking forward to all things being made right and it's announced right after all things went wrong okay in Genesis 12 the Lord is speaking to Abraham and is promising him that in his seed says I will make you a great nation I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Do you see that future eschatological vision of every family, every, every nation on earth being blessed through Abraham's descendant, namely Jesus? Think of how the book of Psalms ends. Psalm 150. Praise him with the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and the stringed instrument. Praise him with the timbrel and dancing. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And just that, let everything that has breath, let every living creature praise the Lord. That's the eschatological vision of the Old Testament. When Old Testament believers 
looked forward to the coming of the Messiah. What they were looking forward to was every creature on the planet at peace and worshiping the Lord in their own peculiar way. You know, everything that has breath. That would be quite a choir, quite an orchestra. In Isaiah 65, this is the chapter I said, I hope we have time, and uh, we do, praise God. We have time to look at this. Um, Isaiah 65, a lot of wonderful visions the Lord gave Isaiah towards the end of this book. And in verse 17, it's describing the future. Isaiah is bringing the word of the Lord. So this is the Lord speaking. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. And the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people no more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. Um, they shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Now, I asked you to think about which of the three views this passage seems to represent. There's a lot of premillennialists who would say, it sure sounds premillennial because it sounds like there's this blessed kingdom where people are still occasionally dying. Because it says, we'll think someone died too early if they die before 100. Right? Because they're taking it very literally. And the amillennialists will say, why are you taking it literally? The, the rhetorical point is, it's a new heavens and a new earth. And the premillennialist is like, why are you ignoring the actual phrase, the actual word in there? <laughs> you can't just brush it over as a, as a metaphor. So you can see why there's a debate about these things. I, I think this is describing the eternal state and that God always reserves the right to fulfill his promises in a better fashion than it's expressed. So if I promise to take you out for dinner tomorrow night, but instead I do that and give you money to eat out for the next 500 days, did I break my promise when I delivered more than I gave you? Or did I fulfill it big time? So that's, that's the way an amillennialist will look at some of these passages. They'll say, yeah, God promised Abraham the land, the land of Canaan, the land of Israel. But he ended up giving Abraham the world. And it's OK to say that that's a fulfillment. Now, I'm going to try to back that up with real Bible verses. Let's take a look at Romans chapter 4. Paul is talking about faith and being justified by faith in Jesus. And he says in Romans 4, verse 13, For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law but through the righteousness of faith. This promise, Paul says, that Abraham would inherit the world. Now, Put on your thinking cap. Where in the Bible, where in the Old Testament did God promise Abraham the world? You can't exactly look this up on Blue Letter Bible or Bible Gateway. It's like, where did he promise? Well, the best we can tell, the closest we can find in the Old Testament of a promise to Abraham that he would inherit the world is in Genesis 17. And here's how it's expressed. 
and I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So this is the all-millennial perspective of this, is that the Lord promises Abraham the land of Canaan. Later, the Apostle Paul says, you know what God promised Abraham? The world. Because even though God only specifically told Abraham about this little piece of real estate in the Middle East, God had intended all along to give him that, but to give him so much more so that when Jesus sends his church out in Matthew 28 and says, go in into all the world, preach the gospel, you know, teach the nations, disciple the nations, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. At that moment, Jesus is sending them out to the Holy Land. Because the Holy Land now is not like, sign up next year and join me for a all expenses paid tour of the Holy Land. No. Actually, it will be all expenses paid for me if I get 10 of you to sign up. So uh, we will go tour the Holy Land where Jesus walked. You know, Jesus made the whole earth arguably the Holy Land by, by prom he promised Abraham this much. He's delivering that much. Now, Another way to look at this, same, same sort of expansion of fulfillment, where there's this limited literal prediction that ends up being bigger and better. Take a look at Micah chapter 4. It's a great passage because it uses the word latter days or last days, right? Micah chapter 4, it shall come to pass in the latter days. And I've been giving you my opinion that latter days means ever since Jesus ascended into heaven up till whenever he comes again. So it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and it shall be lifted up above the hills and people shall flow to it. And many nations shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways. The mountain that's in view for Micah and his immediate audience is Mount Zion, where Jerusalem is. But listen to how the New Testament treats Micah 1 through 5. If you go to the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, it says this, verse 22, Hebrews 12, 22. But you, talking to present-day Christians in the first century, you have come already. You have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. When you worship the Lord on the Lord's Day, on the first day of the week, you come either to this church or some other wonderful church, and you're worshiping God with all your you know, strength, mind, and heart, and, and you know who else is there besides the beautiful people next to you? The holy angels of God. You have come to Mount Zion. Not someday you will come to Mount Zion. Someday when we've finally taken over the government and the institutions, someday when we finally get our act together, then the mountain of the Lord will rise up above the other mountains. No, the author of Hebrews, in a time of deep persecution, his immediate audience in the book of Hebrews were ready to walk away from the church and their faith. And this whole letter is being written to them to like, stick with Jesus. Don't give up because you know what? You have come already to the mountain. It's now. What might basically... Hebrews is saying, Hebrews 12, 22 is saying, what Micah predicted back in Micah 4, 1 and following, it's happening. This is the mountain. And, and so, if you go with the hermeneutic, the interpretation that everything is literal in the Bible, unless it's impossible to sustain that, <laughs> it's like, well, we're at Micah 4, it says the mountain of the Lord will rise up higher than all the other mountains. Is that possible to make it literal? You bet it is. Like, how do you think the mountains came to be? I, I, I used to live near the Ring of Fire in, uh, near Portland, Oregon. Mount Hood is a volcano. You know, like Mount St. Helens blew up when I was in high school. So there's, 
mountains can rise up. Is that what Micah is saying? Do you think? I mean, maybe. Maybe Mount Zion, which is just kind of like a modest hill, maybe it will someday be higher than Mount Everest. That would be literal fulfillment if you want that. Or what about Hebrews 12 saying, huh, the presence of Jesus in his church, that's what the mountain of the Lord was all about all along. And so just like the Lord promised Abraham a little bit of real estate and gave him the whole world, sent the church out into the whole world to make all of us children of Abraham by faith, just like God expanded the real estate, that metaphor about the mountain rising up, that's, that's arguably the work of the Holy Spirit, the gospel at work in the world. And you've come to it. When every regular Sunday, even if the music is just okay and the preaching is just okay, hey, it doesn't matter. The angels are there. You've come to Mount Zion. You've come to everything in Hebrews 12 is talking about. All right. First Thessalonians already mentioned this, that Paul says, hey, I don't want you to be scared that thinking Jesus has already come back. First this is going to happen, then that's going to happen, and you can read it, but then he, he lands the plane by saying, comfort one another with these words. And that we should really remember that, that that's the tenor, that's the tone. That when we talk about the future, it's like God's got this. He's sovereign. Comfort, comfort people who are actually suffering and are anxious with the message that, yes, there's persecution and suffering in this life, but do you realize the wonderful things God is doing in the world, changing so many people for good? So we have just a little bit of time, but we would, be a, we would be remiss if we did not look at what Jesus said in Matthew 24. And we're, yeah, we still can do some of this. So Jesus' disciples, they were into eschatology more than you and me. After he rose from the dead, they're thinking, hey, Remember when we used to argue with each other about who would be the greatest in the kingdom? We were so young and naive then. But look, he rose from the dead. It's happening. So it's back on the agenda. We're taking over. This is exciting. And so they ask him, um, when, what, 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 let me get this, uh, Matthew 24, verse 3. Tell us, they say, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And then Jesus talks to them. Okay? So they ask him more than one question. It's possible that when Jesus then speaks to them over the next chapter of red letters, if you have a red letter Bible, um, it's possible that Jesus is answering one question and then another, even though it all kinds of, kind of flows together. Their questions are, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and the sign of the end of the age? Now, these signs are not exactly signs. Like when Jesus talks about the signs, he says, well, there will be wars and rumors of wars. There will be earthquakes. Yeah, that's a sign. But then what does Jesus say? He like kind of takes it away right after he says it. He says, but those are just Braxton Hicks. You know, that those are just like, early birth pains, not the contractions yet. Don't go to hospital yet, okay? Um, in verse 9, Jesus says this, they will deliver you, he says to the disciples, up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. This is happening to you. It sounds like this is happening in the apostles' lifetime. But then you get to verse 13, and 14, the one who, does, who endures to the end will be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. That sounds like it's going to happen at the very end, the very end. So some of what Jesus tells the disciples is like right then in their lifetime. Some seems to be postponed to an indeterminate future. In fact, Jesus even says, I don't know the day or the hour. Only God the Father knows. Now, some, especially premillennialists, have said, well, we don't know the day or the hour, but we can know the week 
and the month and the year. And I'll tell you, it's going to be the first week of October in 1990. Oh, that already happened. Um, okay, so some seems to be immediate, some seems to be in the future. Gospel proclamation to the very end. There's so many things here that you can read the commentaries and find out. Uh, I would recommend the book by Hokuma on this passage. Um, there's a point here in Mark, which is the parallel passage in Mark 13, where Jesus says, this generation will not pass away before all these things will take place. And this is what leaves everybody scratching their head. What does that mean? Hokuma says, what Jesus means by this generation is not the lifetime of the present people. Hokum is convinced that this means this type of person, this adulterous generation, this unbelieving generation, that there's going to be opposition to the gospel right up until the end. I was persuaded maybe you'll have a different view of it. There's so much here. Um, maybe you've been confused before when you open up the book of Revelation and on the very first page it says the things which must soon take place. And you're thinking, yeah, that was 2,000 years ago. How can that be soon? Well, from a biblical eschatological perspective, soon means the next thing on God's calendar. Like, you say, hey, can we meet, catch up for coffee next week? Oh, no, it's a busy week for me. I got a lot of things going on. And then you get me in a good month, like any time. Well, the idea of the things which soon must take place, it's like, from God's perspective, the only thing that's going to happen before Jesus comes again is more people are going to be saved. <laughs> you know, like, the more people in all the cultures of the world are going to come to faith in Christ and the church will grow. That nothing else needs to happen other than the changing of a life and a family and a community. So live in a state of readiness. It's not as if, oh, there's 10 huge important events that first must take place and then. Now, you, like when you read that phrase and then the end will come in the Bible, it's usually stuff like this gospel of the kingdom will be preached and then the end will come. So the only thing on the calendar before the end is missions, evangelism. Now, like still write poems, still you know, work in the school, drive a cement truck, do all the things to the glory of God, but, but our prayers are, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We live in a state of readiness. Um, all right. What, when people talk about the success of Jesus as a king, what kind of success? Is it uh, success measured by worldly metrics, or is it success in the gospel redeeming people's lives. And, and then they are involved in being salt and light in the culture for sure. Um, already you, according to Paul in Ephesians, he says already you are seated in heavenly places with Christ. You are not yet home with the Lord. You will be uh, the moment that you die as a believer, absent from the body, is present with the Lord. Already you are justified by faith in Christ. You are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, but you are not yet glorified. Already you are crucified with Christ and raised with him, but not yet are you freed from all sorrow and sickness and so forth. Um, Jesus consistently forecast mission to the entire world and successful, fruitful harvest. But what does he say after the rich young ruler walks away from Jesus, he says, uh, uh, Peter says, well, we left everything for you, Jesus. What about us? And Jesus says, oh, you will be uh, richly repaid, hundredfold. All of you who have left real estate, and jobs, and security, and family, you'll receive a hundred times that much. And then he says, and persecutions. So Jesus promises that in the church family, you'll receive so much more than all. Like, it was hard leaving your family, but you've received so much more. But you're also promised suffering and pain 
And that's, that's part of our eschatological outlook too, martyrdom. Um, so expect the church to grow and expect pushback and persecution. Um, this is the last slide before Q&A. Uh, when Paul is speaking in the book of Acts, he says, he summarizes his eschatological outlook by, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. We're entering the kingdom of God but it's through many tribulations. So it's like both the realistic suffering and some real gospel fruit. I did go over time, and I'm sorry, but we still do have some time for Q&A. So some of you have already submitted questions, and however David wants to do it. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, I think you, you did either explain this really clearly or confuse us all. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so the question goes, when will the rapture happen? Ah, okay. I, I think the rapture works like this. By the way, we only have one place in the Bible that talks about it, really, and that's 1 Thessalonians. And the idea is you have to understand from the ancient world that there were cities, and then a king who was king over that city would return from a battle, return from a war. And he's coming back as the victorious king. And when he comes back, it's like the whole city turns out to have like a big parade, a big welcoming ceremony. So they pour out of the gates of the city to meet their wonderful king. That's the picture of the rapture. And, and so then, so, so just to illustrate that, Jesus is coming. Every eye will see him. I don't know how that will happen. We're on a sphere. I don't know how every eye sees him, but, you know, we have to work on that. So every eye will see him. He's coming on the clouds. And his people, you and me, if we happen to be alive at that point, we are caught up into the air to meet the Lord in the air. It's like we are rushing out of the city to meet our king. And then what happens is he doesn't whisk us away to heaven. If you read that passage in 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul doesn't say, and then he sequesters them away while he does something with the Jews. It's, he says, and so shall we ever be with the Lord, is what he says. So it's like once we meet him in the air, we will be with Jesus then forever and ever. Now, what I think happens is we are caught up in the air, that's the rapture, and then we immediately come down with Jesus. He, was, he wasn't just dipping in for like a flyby, flyover, he was coming down to be here. And so then we're, which you might wonder, like, why? Why are we doing this thing of, like, levitating? I don't know. We have to talk more about that. But that's, that's the rapture from, like, the millennial point of view. <laughs> All right, quite a few other questions. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're not off the hook yet. <laughs> so what did Jesus mean by this? Uh, the day is coming. Yes, I think that's an example of what we call partial preterism. I think that's an example of something that took place in 70 AD in the temple that when the Romans came in and desecrated the temple. And, and that, that was similar to what Daniel spoke about, the abomination that causes desolation, when back in, say, the, I forget if it was the second or third century BC, Antiochus Epiphanes, this really wicked Greek guy came in and sacrificed a pig in the Jerusalem temple just to be really mean about it. And that was just horrific. Well, Jesus is saying that sort of abomination is going to happen again. And I, I think if you read that part of Matthew 24, I think it is, uh, the idea is um, he's speaking at that point to that literal generation because he's giving them cues on when you hear this stuff get out of town flee to the mountains okay pray that it won't be in winter so it's all it's all very strategic and so it's i i i don't think it means that 20 years from now someone will rebuild a temple in jerusalem and then someone will do something really abominable and blasphemous in it 
I think that thing happened back in 70 AD. Okay. Yeah. Um, this one is a, is a good one. Um, can you affirm the more fascinating part? Just the next one. Okay. Um, there are people who believe in soul sleep, and I think they're wrong. They believe that you die, and then your spirit sleeps in a state of, you know, unconsciousness. The next thing you no, it's the last day. So it amounts to the same thing, but that doesn't jive with other passages of scripture. So the idea of soul sleep is not the best way to look at this. It's, it's um, you and I as humans, we have at least two parts. Some people say three, we won't argue that. But you are at least a body and a soul, spirit, okay? Um, your body, when you die, is buried or cremated or something, it's going to be raised, literally, someday, and then remade and glorified. And that will be even better. So think of it this way, good, better, and best. Good, right now. Paul says to the Philippian church, it is good that I am still here. But it will be better, he says, to be with the Lord. And then it will be best when this mortal body puts on immortality. Uh, we will all be changed in the twinkling of an eye, he says. Uh, so um, the, the idea is, like I'm, your question is asking, can I prove that the moment the Christian dies, their spirit or soul is with the Lord? Um, boy, I, some of you might know the verses that I'm struggling to come up with in my head, but... Um, Listen to how Paul talks about it in Philippians 1. Um, he says, I'm hard pressed, verse 23, between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. Now I ask you, how is that far better for Paul if it's going to be postponed for 2,000 years while his soul sleeps? He's thinking, no, my desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. He, he's, he's thinking... I'm going to die, they're going to chop off my head, you know, the Romans are, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be with Christ. But to remain in the flesh is far more necessary on your account. So those are the two options that Paul imagines, remaining in the flesh or being with the Lord. He doesn't imagine a third option, which some people propose, and that's sleeping as a soul for however long, so yeah. Okay. When, when. Oh, when? <laughs> I just described the picture, but when will the rapture take place? Uh, when Jesus comes back. And he says, no one knows the day or the hour. Only the Father uh, knows. Um, and he gives us a sense, like, the best clue we have as to what happens before he comes again is the gospel going out to all the world. Now, you can take that very literally and say, hey, ease up. He's not, he's not coming back this year. Because you know Wycliffe Bible translators, they've counted the number of languages in the world that don't even have a Bible yet and the number of unreached people groups, and it's like 6,000 unreached groups. So even with the aid of AI, it's not happening this year. Right? But... Listen to how Paul talks about the spread of the gospel in the first century. Just to complicate it for you, in Colossians chapter 1, Paul says, if I can find this on the fly, about the gospel being proclaimed all over the world. Maybe someone can find it. Verse 6? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing. From Paul's point of view, because the gospel had gone out over the whole Mediterranean world, 
it had gone out into the whole world. That's one way that the Bible itself speaks about these things. So that's why I say we should live with a sense of imminence. After all, many of Jesus' parables on the matter are saying, be ready, watch, be ready. That would have no point if we happen to know that there's 6,000 unreached people groups and just, it's not going to happen. Like, when people ask me, do you think the end is soon? I'm like, I hope so. It's far better to be with the Lord. And then, then I'm thinking, oh, I, I, hope, I hope this person comes to faith first. You know, so it's, we're, we're in that tension just like Paul was, of, of wanting, the, wanting Jesus to come back and wanting people to be rescued. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Yeah.